For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We're in Luke, the second chapter today. We're looking at verses 10 through 18. You'll um, know that all of my studies this year have come from Luke, the second chapter, and have been about the Bethlehem shepherds. And today I want to talk about the Word became flesh, and I, I want to show you how it became flesh on the same day to two different ways. Same day, two different ways. Uh, I want to pick up with verse 10 in the story. And an angel said to them, Do not be afraid for speaking to the shepherds. Uh, For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the host a multitude of the, uh, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angel had gone away from then into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see the thing which has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste, and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. I want you to pay attention to verse 17 and 18. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. What statement and who told it? See? That's very important because of verse 18. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. What did the shepherds go into the town of Bethlehem and tell the people? They told them exactly what had been told to them. And just exactly what had been told to them. Well, it's found in verse 11, or 10 and 11 and 12. When he said, I bring you good news or gospel, gospel news, I bring you gospel news of great joy, which will be for all people. And they, listen, they went into Bethlehem and gave that good news. And I'll tell you why, because they believe it was for all people. And I hope that we'll grasp that message in our heart today. I believe this gospel, the good news that was brought on that day of the birth of Christ, is the same good news and more reality in our life today. And listen, it is for all people. And all people are not going to hear it if we don't take the message. The message by itself needs to be carried. And that's the point. When the word became flesh, the flesh took the word and told it to others. The word became flesh twice on that day. One time in a manger and the other time in the shepherds. And I want you to grasp that idea today because the message was the good news for all people. For today in the city of David, there's been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And then they told him where to go find that baby. You will find this baby. And he gave them a sign. And and listen, that's all they had. And it was enough because they were put, able to put the rest of it together through their own Bible study, through their own spiritual growth. They were put, able to put the rest of it together and went into the town and told all the people, gave them the gospel as it had been given to them. And that day the word became flesh twice. Once in the manger and once in the shepherds. And hopefully today it will happen a third time. May we become that shepherd 
that is excited about the gospel of Christ that is for all mankind. May we take it. May we take the message to other people. We need to take it. We need to be the shepherds of the word of God. The word has to be birthed in us to be able to give it out. So let's have a word of prayer. It's good to have Joe Griffin with us. He and Mama. He and Miss, Mrs. Joe. And Joe will be our speaker next Sunday. So I'm going to tease you with it by having him offer a prayer. This is a, f a foretaste of things to come. What I find interesting about this whole story of Luke 2, and especially with the shepherds, what I find interesting, of all the people in the world, you know, Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom we're foremost, Paul said. Of all the people in the world that were invited to the birth of God's only begotten Son, the shepherds were the only ones invited. Now think about that for a moment. The prophets weren't invited. Pastors weren't invited. Uh, the political leaders weren't invited. The Supreme Court wasn't invited. And yet this is a major event in the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. This is a major event for the world. And yet the only people invited, the only people invited to the birth of Jesus Christ were these shepherds. Now, we, we wonder, what makes these shepherds so important? And listen, when the shepherds left, they didn't go tell the mayor, the city council, didn't gather all the pastors together and have a pastor's conference. They went to whosoever will listen. They became evangelists. They became missionaries right off the cuff, or I might say right off the hoof. They became missionaries. There's a great lesson there for me, and I hope for you. This is the message that I have in my heart about this story. Who were these shepherds? And we've spent two lessons talking about these unique temple shepherds who kept watch over the shadow Christology animals of the blood of Christ. And I'll tell you something about him. They were spiritual mature believers. And I'll show it to you today as our lesson progresses. It just amazes me. They were the only ones invited to the birth. This enormous event that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. In this major enormous event, they're the only ones invited. And listen, they were invited in a unique way. Angels of heaven were sent down with this message the military choir from heaven was sent out to sing this song. Listen, the message and this enormous song, Gloria in Excelsis Deo in Latin, is sung just to these shepherds. Think about that. I don't know where we get this song, Lowly Shepherds. I, I guess it means that they were in the lowly places. I, I don't. But listen, they were certainly elevated that day, were they not? Whatever these, whatever lowly shepherds made in that song, they're they're when they leave this scene this day, they're the high they're the high court. That's amazing to me. It just gives a guy like me a lot of a lot of energy to know that you can be from Podunk and nobody even cares about you, and God can save your soul and put you on a mission that's just amazing between you and God. It may not be amazing. Nobody else may care about these shepherds but a guy like me. I pay attention to what God did with these lowly shepherds because this was an enormous day and they were prepared for this day. They had studied and they had 
prayed and they had prepared their life for this day when the chief shepherd, when the good shepherd would come to the shepherds of shadow Christology and fulfill them just like Micah said he would. It's a a great day in their life. And I hope you understand that these are the days, these are the days that God has for your life. God has these days for your life. I mean, special days with God. Do you have those special days when you know that God is present in your life and that you you have the joy of Christ? And isn't it interesting on those days the people he brings to you that need the message that your heart is full of? Isn't it interesting how that works? When you have that sour puss, nothing, don't get in my way attitude, I ain't got time for nobody, don't even come, I see you coming, don't come over here. The day pretty much goes the same way, doesn't it? So the shepherds are in a good place, and listen, not only that, they pull night duty. You know how bad it is to pull night duty? And the, I mean, I mean... I did a third shift. This is the worst thing in the whole wide world. Drove me back to school. That third shift motivated me to go back to college after that summer. Third shift. These were guys on the third shift. You know, they might have they might have all said, "Oh man, I got the third shift tonight." Everybody went. Keep, listen, I think about this because I I ran into this. Hey, would you work for my shift? I'll pay you for it. Well, you're going to pay me more than I make now. I know, I know. I'm good for it. I'll I'll give you more. Can you imagine the guys that sold their place so that they could attend all the festive things that was going on in the city, all the people in town and everything? Can you imagine? They missed it. Uh, They missed it. How important is it to be at the right place at the right time with the right attitude for God to do great things in your life? May that be part of the story today as we get get this. Where did I get the idea of the word become flesh? Well, I, of course I got it from John's writing, John 1.1 1, 1 and John 14. I wrote John 14 on your paper, 1 John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Let me tell you, the angels got it, but let me tell you, that wasn't just any baby for them. That was the good shepherd that had come to lay down his life for the sheep. Those shepherds understood that message because they had attended all these temple, all these temple sheep, all these shadow Christology animals. Nobody, nobody better to understand the good shepherd that had been born that day than them. Well, I want, to, I want to deal with four things this morning about how this happened twice on one day, the word becoming flesh. In the first point, I want us to understand that these temple shepherds bore witness of the messianic word of God being fulfilled by Micah's prophecy of, of Micah, fourth chapter, verse 8, which we studied, and in Micah 5, 2, you know, in Bethlehem. These two passages are really important in prophetic prophecy about about Christ. Not only did they get a chance that day to see Micah's prophecy fulfilled, which was very important to them because Micah 4 and Micah 5 are really big on these temple shepherds. They understood that when Messiah came, he would come as a shepherd. And Jesus reminded them that he's... Listen, the Bible calls him the good shepherd, the chief shepherd. I mean, there are just many terms given about the shepherd, the messianic shepherd. He's the smitten shepherd. The Bible records about seven different terms, adjectives, identifying Jesus Christ as a shepherd. I, I, I pay attention to him as a pastor, he is my chief shepherd. He's my chief pastor teacher. My chief pastor teacher is Jesus Christ. Verse 
that's important to me as it was important to these shepherds. These temple shepherds bore witness of the Messianic word being fulfilled both by the prophecy of the prophet Micah, which would have been their favorite, probably, prophet, and by the angel of the Lord who had come to them privately, personally, to announce the birth of the Son of God. What I want us to pay attention to is they were personally invited to witness the prophetic word becoming historical flesh. Now grasp that for a moment. When they come to the manger and see Christ, the Christ child, two things have just occurred in their life prophetically. One, they have seen the Messianic prophecies fulfilled in their day, in their presence. Boom, there it is. The second thing they saw is that Christ was now born into the world. You almost have to wrap your brain around how the Old Testament people viewed the coming of Christ because there was no first, second coming in the Old Testament. As such, there was just the coming of Christ and he would do all of these things. It was the church age that entered in and divided the first coming from the second coming so that we have a distinctive first and second coming. The church was that great mystery in this whole story of the coming of Christ into the world. The church is that great mystery part of it. It sets in the middle of the old and the new. It it is part of the new, of course. But it it sets the division between the first coming and the second coming. For example, when we do the Eucharist, when they did the Passover, they looked for the coming of Christ, period. When we do the Eucharist, we look for the second coming of Christ. They didn't have that distinction until this day right here. The historical coming of Christ is going to be Those guys that are able to live out the next 30 years are going to see things that are just beyond belief. Can you imagine those who have lived from 30 AD to 60 AD, what they have seen this man Jesus Christ do and the development of the entire church? I mean, 30 years is a powerful 30 years. You have you have the 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 book of Acts outlaid in that period, and this great missionary work, conversion of Paul, and just imagine what these shepherds have seen in the next thirty years. Has been permitted. They, they saw their they saw the good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep, and then take it back up resurrected the third day. Post-resurrection appearances goes back to the Father and the church's birth and, and things just went like lightning across the Roman Empire, this message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how fortunate we are that there were shepherds in our life that carried the message to America and Americans carried it to us. Just think of that. That little message that began in Bethlehem in a, in a stable reached across the world, reached across centuries, and sets right here to be a viable option in the lives of people today. Will I believe that Jesus died for my sins, buried and raised from the dead the third day, and be saved and receive eternal life and the benefits of that? I mean, will we have the courage to do that? Will we have the good sense to do that? Just think about the people who brought the message to your life. I mean, they're forever etched in mind. I remember everybody. They're like stepping stones in my life to where I am today. The people that God brought in my life from my pre, pre, pre-salvation days where they came and shared with me and, and prayed over me and, and wept over my, my need to be saved. And then the people after I was saved that 
nurtured me up to where I am today and people still doing it. I mean, just think of that. And they began in this little town of Bethlehem where we find these shepherds becoming missionaries of the message of the gospel of Christ. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by that. What they got to see that day, I think sometimes we miss by just singing songs about them, not paying attention to what they really witnessed. The second thing that was important to me, what I want to share with you, is how the word of God became flesh in these shepherds. See, they went to see the word of God become flesh, but when they saw it, the word became flesh in them. Think about that a minute. Because what did they do? They took that word that had become flesh, they took that word, put it in them, and took it out to give to other people. You know, that's what the word of God is all about, is becoming flesh in us, where the reality of it becomes how we think, how we feel about life, about ourselves, about other people. When that word of God is birthed in you through the gospel, you know, when I see somebody and, and he smiles or says hello to me, I immediately think, where is your soul? Is it well with you today? If we all had to sing that song, could we sing that song? It is well with my soul. I think about that. I think about every person I meet. If you're not saved, your soul will never be well without Christ. And if you are saved, why isn't it well with Christ? What is going on in your life? What kind of things have hindered you from that sense of well-being that it is well with my soul? I meet both of those people and so do you. Maybe I look for them a little harder. Maybe not. You know what I find in her is the same zeal that they had to find the baby. Same zeal, the same interest, the same fire. They had to share it with others. They went to find the baby. Then they went to find somebody to tell it about. Now listen to that. They went to find the baby. When they found the baby, they went to tell somebody about the baby, not about the baby, but about the message of the baby. They didn't go say, the baby, a baby's been born. We know from Matthew 2 that there was a lot of babies born. I mean, they must have had a bad winter the year before. I mean, there were a lot of babies born during that time. Herod killed a whole bunch of the babies born in that age range. Listen, that same thing that led us to Christ should lead us from Christ to others. If there's anything I want you to grasp a hold in your soul this year is don't overlook anybody, anybody, Somebody comes by and says, have you got a dollar for gas? I, I haven't got a dollar, but I'll give you a dollar's worth of gas, and I'm going to take that time. I may, may take $2 or $3 in order to have enough time to give them the gospel. I'm going to give them gas without the gospel. I'm not going to give them groceries without the gospel. God didn't bring him in my life to give him gas. Wait. So for me, I found a, a day of excitement. I found that they found the, the word become flesh and that word became flesh in them. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you a little bit technical. In Luke, the second chapter, if you're, stu if you're following me, I'm, in, I'm under point two. But in Luke, the second chapter, verses 17 and 18, it says, and when they had seen this, that is, the baby, just like the angel said, and like the choir sang about, when they when and and when they had seen this, watch this now, they made known the statement. There's a definite article in the Greek language. There's a definite article that places specific emphasis, and the word is rima, R H E M A. The word is rima. 
It's not logos, it's rima. It means a specific category, a statement, a specific category. They didn't just go and start with Genesis and read through the Bible with them. Not logos. Rima, what they did is they took the message that had been given to them, which was verse 10, 11, and 12, and gave it just as it had been given to them. See, that's what the gospel does. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He is raised from the dead. If you believe it, you're saved. If you don't believe it, you're not. It's not complicated. Anybody can get that. Anybody gets it can get saved. It's exactly, the, the word rhema means they didn't give them all of the, they didn't talk about Micah 5, and they didn't talk about Micah 4. They didn't go through a Genesis 3.15. They didn't go through the whole idea of Christ coming into the world. They went with the gospel, with a specific message, which was the gospel. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, Christ the Lord. Not complicated. Made it very simple. Made it very simple. A guy like me could have never got saved if the gospel had not been simple. And it's just that simple. Will you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead? Will you believe that? If you believe it, you'll be saved. You won't be saved any other way. It's the Rima doctrine. It's the Rima doctrine. They made known the statement that had been told them. The word told is laleo means communicated to them that they heard. It's an aorist passive participle. I say that because it's, it's stated again and with those who heard them. Now look, they took the message that had been communicated to them, verses 10, 11, and 12, and watch, and then which if they went and made known the statement, and, and now we hear the third party. Listen, now we're into a third party, right? The shepherds, the, the angels came to the shepherd, the shepherd went to the people. You with me? They brought the message from God, they delivered it to the shepherds, the shepherd delivered it to the some people. Are you with me? We're a third party. Now listen, in this verse it says, and all who heard... Their message wondered at all the things which were told. Now listen to me. That's Laleo, which they had communicated, just like the angel communicated to them, air is passive participle. They communicated to a third party, air is passive participle of Rima. And that, and that, that's, that's what God is telling you. The message that you have of the gospel of Jesus Christ that has been brought to you and you've believed on it, take that message to a third party. Now, in the, when the angels brought it, it's called the angels of the Lord. When the second party got it, it was called the shepherds who got, who got the message. When the shepherds took it out there, it's kind of like to whosoever. And all who heard, listen to that, and all who heard were amazed at the message of the shepherds. Have you gone back to like your 20 or 25th uh, high school reunion? Then you will understand the word wonder. When they say, well, what do you do now, Ron? I'm kind of pastor. You're what? I'm pastor. What? I'm a pastor. I, I'm a minister. <laughs> Give up. Was it a prison thing? Did you saved in prison and your way to get out? Was it pass go deal? Have you been to yours and took a look around and what do you do? Well, probably most of you so you so put together. They everybody well, I I'd, I'd have known you'd have been an engineer. I'd have known you'd have been a successful businessman. But a slug like me comes through.
They, they, and that's the, that's the miracle. That's the wonder in this word. And all who heard it wondered. Wondered. Three, the word becomes flesh in these shepherds as a sign of their spiritual growth maturity. I'm going to show you something because we've been studying this on, on uh, Tuesday night. We've been studying spiritual growth maturity on Tuesday night, how you get there and how it develops and all of that. We're still in it, by the way. We have learned that one of the six characteristics of super grace maturity is called logos. That's getting, that's actually in the second Corinthians eighth chapter, verse seven, where this is identified. The logos is translated in the English Bible as either speech or utterance. Because it's the manifestation, it's the communicating of the word of God as you understand it and believe it. You know, we never share with people what we don't believe. Did you ever notice that? I mean, if you don't really believe in the power of prayer, you never pray with anybody. Why why would you do that? That's just giving them a blank check. There ain't nothing, no way to cash it. Wait, Wait, listen. These guys, this logos, when it is birthed in you, it brings speech and utterance of the logos. When the logos is in you, then the utterance or the speech is about the logos, the the word of God. You speak the word of God. You speak the word of God. You tell people. You may not say, you may not give them the, the chapter and the verse, but you give them the concepts. And as you advance in your growth, you begin to give them the scriptures. And if they're interested, you can tell them and you can open their Bible and show them where it is. It can be done either way. The shepherds went into town and declared the birth of the good shepherd savior. That's a clue that, listen, they heard it. They believed it on the spot. They didn't go home and meditate on it and call up their pastor and say, is this in line? They didn't do that. They had the maturity to hear it, get it, put it together in the complex of doctrines. They went, I mean, the, the, the ping pong ball was going. Remember those old machines where you, you bring it back and the what was that thing? Ping ball? No, pinball. Remember, you pull it back and then you'd work that thing, remember? Oh, jeez. Everything's on your cell phone now, ain't it, huh? You know what I'm talking about. And you'd actually have to go someplace and push something and do something. But I remember that. <laughs> work that machine. Listen. That's when you got that doctrine in there and and listen, something happens. These guys are there this this little message is given and they're going, that ball is going like and doctrine is going like bing, 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 bing. And they're putting it together. That's what spiritual mature people have the ability to do. That's how you know you're advancing spiritually in your life. These shepherds have that ability to do that because we're witnessing it. I don't have to guess that I'm seeing it. Finally, one of the divine honors bestowed upon a believer who reaches and maintains spiritual maturity and a super grace status of it, listen, he's going to have, and you're going to see it in these guys, you're going to, here's what the Bible promises you. It promises you, Historical and spiritual impact in the plan of God. It promises you. Now listen, to go to church all your life and never have the opportunity to have what these shepherds had. Not in this church. That ain't going to happen in this church. This ain't going to happen. 
we're going to prepare you in such a way spiritually so when that moment comes in you listen this was a one listen this was a one night one deal one moment situation they miss this night they don't get it come on now this is not going to, you're not going to be able to get it from John Dyer and play it over and look at it come on I mean, this is the this is the night God has prepared in their life, and it's going to come. And listen, it's going to last for eternity, because this super grace people, these spiritual mature people, had doctrine in there, and they were able to pull it back, let that thing bing around, and go where the binging went. They put this stuff together. Abraham, when he goes up and offers Isaac, that's what he's doing. He's doing that ping pong deal, that pinball deal. And, and listen, it's successful. And he goes like, look, this don't make any sense. Do this. I mean, you gave me the child. Now you say, oh, well, this is not making sense. Genesis 22. But listen, he's able to pull it together. And when you read his story in Hebrews 11, chapter 17 through 19, he's going to tell you exactly how it worked. And that's how it works in your life and mine. That's why you come to Bible study. That's why you pay attention. That's why you learn. That's why you allow the Holy Spirit to, to teach and recall. That's the dynamics and the power of it. One of the divine honors bestowed upon a believer who reaches and maintains spiritual maturity is historical and spiritual impact in the plan of God. Listen, when I was writing this down, this dawned on me, you know, like one of those pieces of lightning that fall. Because I was so intent about these shepherds and the, the, the just the, the way God how he fulfilled this in their life, it just staggered me. And I thought, they went from, listen, this and this is a sign of maturity, they went from trusting God to do for them to trusting, to, to, to God, listen to me, to God trusting them to do for him. Did you hear that? If you didn't hear it, just read it. Sometimes it, you're better off reading it anyhow. Then try to listen to me stammer and stumble all the way through these words. Just think about that just for a moment. The power of that idea. That's a sign of maturity. When God is able to trust you to do for him. Were they, were, did he trust him with it? Listen, were there a bunch of options that God had that day? Well, he brought the mayor and the political people and the, all the prophets and all that. Did he do that? And then say, well, maybe somebody, I'll just throw it out there and maybe somebody will get it. Hmm, buddy, he laid it all on them. Huh? Am I missing something? I don't think so. I'm missing something, no doubt about it, but I'm missing, I'm not missing that idea. See, I think that's a doctrinal principle. I think that's a grace principle from God to us. When they received this revelation of the birth of the Savior, they immediately responded to the directive will of God, that new revelation, by putting the messianic doctrines together by spiritual maturity, going to see the baby. They'd been given a sign. They went to see the baby. And then they went to tell about the baby. That's pretty good. That's maturity. You know, you come to church, you hear the message. Spiritual maturity. Listen, come on now. Stay stay with me for a year or so. You'll get there. You got to stay a while, though. You can't come and visit all the time. You got to stay a little bit. Plant your flag here for a while. And you're going to find this happen in your life, and it's not going to come because you want it worse than you want, you know. It's going to come because it's a natural process of growth. You're going to want, it will just be natural that the things you're learning, you're sharing because you believe them. You believe them. And I found it true with this group. This idea we saw earlier with Abel, listen, here it is. Here, here's the same truth about when you hit spiritual maturity, this is how God honors you. This is the honor code of spiritual maturity. Here's the honor code. You're not spiritual because you come to church and sat. 
You know, I say it all the time. You don't become a car because you live in the garage. You're not, become a, you're not going to become a spiritual person just because you come and sit in church and say, well, there, God, I went to church today. Check it off. You've got to take it in. You've got to cycle. You've got to 2 Timothy 3.16, this information. All scripture is God breathed, inhaled, exhaled into your life. It happened to Abel, and it happened in these words, and you can always tell, listen, this is your legacy. If you reach spiritual maturity, this is going to be true about you and the plan of God because you're going to have spiritual and historical impact in the plan of God. It says, Abel, the first man mentioned in the hall, the, the spiritual mature hall of fame on faith, said, though he is dead, he still speaks. And because, listen, and because he's in the Bible, he's going to speak throughout eternity. <laughs> now, the canon got closed before, before I come. God, isn't God smart? He closed that baby up on me. But the principle is there. The principle is the legacy you leave behind, even though you're dead. Your spiritual work will still speak on your behalf. That's the honor code. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for those who have come our way to be a part of our service, uh, both in presence and on the Internet. And we pray, Father, for all of those who hear the message, the word this Christmas, the message has been the word became flesh and dwells among us. For what reason? so that he become the fulfillment of the gospel, bring it to completion, so that we can be saved by faith through grace and not of herself as a gift of God. The gospel that says God sent his son. His son was willing to go to the cross on our behalf, not for his sake, but for ours. Because of his love for the Father, his faith in the word of God, he hung on that cross paid the ultimate price for the sins of humanity. About the only thing we can do with all that information, Father, is believe it. And that's enough to save us. Enough to secure us for time and eternity. And we are thankful for that. And I pray today, Father, that once this message becomes in my flesh, when that word becomes flesh in me, I pray that I would be that good shepherd that would be willing to go in spite of all the conflicts and share that good news. To tell the story about the smitten shepherd that becomes the shepherd of our souls for eternity. And may that, Father, be true for all of us this Christmas as we look at a new year. May we be shepherds with a message that the world desires to hear, longs to hear, wonders at this message. We pray, Father, for our offering today that will come now. We pray, Father, we'd be good stewards, spend a little on ourselves and most on carrying the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Encourage our hearts with that. We can live on less to give more to reach in a dying world. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen.